Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. The employment agency was a small office rented on the ground floor of a five-story brick building. In the office, there were two desks where two friendly girls interviewed job applicants, always trying to smile even when they had to decline. Daniela sat across from Teresa, the girl with the badge, at the desk to the left of the entrance. Teresa, with a slightly furrowed brow from tension, carefully examined Daniela's employment record, occasionally cross-referencing data on the computer. Do you have a criminal record? She asked, looking at Daniela. Yes, but it has been expunged. I was granted amnesty, and the case is currently under review. I see, Teresa said thoughtfully and looked at the monitor again. But your charge is embezzlement of narcotics using your official position. And you want to work as a caregiver? Well, yes, but let me reiterate the case is being reviewed, and the record will be expunged. Celia, the girl with the badge at the neighboring desk, closely watched Daniela. She felt uneasy about the situation that had unfolded. Of course, she anticipated difficulties of this nature, but it was a friendly guard from the correctional facility who had given her the agency's business card upon her release, confidently stating, if you're looking for a job, be sure to come here. So she came, thinking there might be some unspoken agreement between the agency and the correctional facility, only to realize it was a mistake. I understand all of this, Teresa continued. But we are obligated to inform employers about all significant information regarding job applicants. I don't think anyone would be willing to entrust their loved ones to a convicted person, even if it may have been unjust under this article. When people have a choice, they won't take unnecessary risks. Do you agree with me? Yes, of course, Daniela sighed. I fully understand how all of this looks from the outside. I apologize for any inconvenience. She reached out to take back all her documents. Teresa, still wearing a frown, slowly gathered the papers into a neat stack and handed them back to Daniela. Celia, at the neighboring desk, continued to gaze at the disheartened Daniela with interest. Damn it, Daniela thought. It's like they brought an exotic animal into the office. And why is she staring at me like that? Daniela put the documents in a transparent blue folder, tucked it into her purse, and walked out into the corridor. In her 26 years, she had managed to pursue three professions, two before being convicted for a crime she didn't commit, nurse and pharmacist, and one directly imprisoned seamstress. Of course, Daniela would prefer to continue working in her primary field, but until her case is fully reviewed and the real culprit is found, if that ever happens, no one would dare to hire her in a hospital or even the most rundown pharmacy. So, the caregiver position was the most realistic chance in the current circumstances. She didn't want to go back to being a seamstress because even in prison, she began experiencing back problems from long hours of sitting, leading to insomnia and constant headaches. But now problems had arisen here too. Daniela cursed the day she got a job two years ago as a nurse for family doctor Senor Montero, who was most likely the one who set her up. When it was discovered that certain seriously ill patients were being prescribed narcotic drugs somewhat illegally, bypassing many bureaucratic details required by law, Senor Montero managed to escape unscathed, spending the entire investigation period supposedly hospitalized with a heart attack. They questioned him without much bias, which couldn't be said about Daniela. The investigators took her seriously from the very beginning, convinced that she was the one, either out of foolishness or malicious intent, who had been involved in illegal dealings with morphine and tramadol. She didn't try to shift the blame onto Senor Montero, as she herself was certain of his innocence and believed that the drugs went missing due to some other reasons that the investigators would eventually discover. But the case was quickly brought to the desired result for someone, and within two months, Daniela found herself behind bars, unable to believe that all of this was actually happening to her. She spent one and a half years in prison, trying every day to understand what had really happened. Daniela didn't file an appeal, didn't talk to a lawyer, didn't write tearful letters to anyone. There was no one to write to, and she had no money to hire a lawyer. Her mother died immediately after giving birth, and her father, consumed by grief and considering the newborn baby as the murderer of his beloved wife, got rid of her a year later by placing her in a private, albeit expensive, orphanage. 
Daniela never saw her father, but until her release from the orphanage, the payment for her upkeep arrived regularly. Daniela was grateful to the mysterious parent for that. Her caregivers and teachers turned out to be good people, and she received a decent education and upbringing. And then, by some cruel twist of fate, she ended up in prison. However, after one and a half years, she was unexpectedly granted amnesty. Her criminal record would be expunged, she would receive positive recommendations, and the sum she earned from sewing would be given to her in full, without deducting the expenses for her upkeep. It was simply miraculous. But having learned from bitter experience, Daniela didn't rush to rejoice at this turn of events. Who knows what could be behind all of this? She didn't have control over the situation and knew nothing about the hidden mechanisms that led to her amnesty. She couldn't relax or make far-reaching plans. Thank God her one-room apartment remained intact and safe. She had some money to get by in the beginning, and she had a business card with the address of an employment agency offering a very interesting caregiver position. That was more than enough for now. With these somber thoughts and memories, Daniela walked along the corridor in search of a bin where she could throw away the torn business card when unexpectedly she was approached by a girl named Celia. Excuse me, she said, addressing Daniela. Is your name Daniela? Yes, it's me. Once again, I apologize. I'm here about a vacant position that might be suitable for you. Daniela raised her eyebrows in surprise. A job? But haven't you heard about my criminal record? Yes, Celia nodded. But in this case, it's not a problem. Here, she handed over another business card on which, against a black background, was written in golden letters, Ruben Crespo Alvarez, lawyer. Daniela twirled the card in her hands, but it didn't bring her any clarity. This is the person, Celia explained. You need to contact him if you seriously need a caregiver job. Why the lawyer? Something happened to his family? No, no, he's the personal lawyer of another person who is looking for a caregiver for himself. Through a lawyer? Yes, I know, it sounds strange. Let me try to explain. I'm not really familiar with the intricacies of this job myself, but what I do know is that the employer himself is located far away, somewhere near the capital. For some reason, there is no internet or cell phone service there, and all of his affairs are handled through the lawyer. I also know that this person is not poor, but, you see, not many people are willing to travel to such a remote place where there is no communication and for an indefinite period, even though the pay is good, 300 per day. 300? Daniela was increasingly surprised. Plus free accommodation and meals provided by the owner. And how long is all of this for? It could be for a month or two, maybe even three. I can't say for sure. As far as I know, the doctors have allocated approximately that amount of time for the elderly man. He is bedridden and still uses a wheelchair, but it's unclear how long this will last. Celia pleaded with Daniela, as if she knew slightly more than she was letting on, and her interest in Daniela went beyond a simple request. What do you say? She almost whispered. Now it was Daniela's turn to furrow her brow. In reality, there was nothing holding her back in the city. If she couldn't find a job, she had enough money to get by for a couple of months, but then what? And why not spend a couple of months in the fresh air, surrounded by pristine nature? After all, if there's no communication, it's probably some kind of hole in the middle of the forest or a swamp. Can you be more specific? Daniela asked. Where exactly? It's near one village. Celia said. The village is small, only 300 people, but the employer's house is about 10 kilometers away from the village, so no one will bother you. Okay. She finally said. I'll visit the lawyer. Thank you. Celia smiled. Just make sure to call him as soon as you can. He's a busy man, but he will definitely answer your call, I assure you. This vacancy is extremely urgent, believe me. Daniela also involuntarily smiled, mostly because of the strange term extremely urgent for a job vacancy. 
She imagined a caught fish struggling in a net, and the smile faded from her face due to that association. Nonetheless, she should exercise caution. Goodbye, she said. And thank you, Celia. I will definitely call the lawyer. Good luck. The manager wished her and quickly walked towards the office where another visitor was probably already waiting for her. The next morning, before calling the lawyer, Daniela went online and looked at the map to see where this village was located, and it turned out to be a rather unusual place. To the left of the village name, there was an icon in the shape of a fortress tower with the word alien written next to it. This alien caught Daniela's interest, and she easily found photos of it on the map. The extraterrestrial turned out to be a monument depicting a weary creature with swollen, squinted eyes, which had knelt down, perhaps out of helplessness or a desire to hide from prying eyes. It amused Daniela a little. The creature seemed quite friendly to her. After scrolling through the photos, Daniela measured the distance from her location to the village, which turned out to be 2,500 kilometers via the shortest route. Oh no! That's more than a day's journey if you don't make any stops. She didn't even bother searching for available train or plane options to get there, thinking that perhaps if the employer invites someone to such a remote place, they must have already considered all possible modes of transportation. It's no wonder no one agrees to this vacancy, but Daniela didn't have any other options for now. She had to wait until her case was finally closed. And that village still seemed familiar to her, although she couldn't find any logical explanations for it. Daniela took out the business card and dialed the number listed on it on her mobile phone. Ruben Crespo Alvarez. A bass voice sounded on the other end. I'm listening. Hello. Daniela's heart started pounding for some reason. I'm calling about the caregiver vacancy. Celia gave me your business card and told me to contact you about it. Ah, uh, yes, yes. The lawyer's voice became friendlier. Good morning. How should I call you? I'm Daniela. The girl said softly. Good morning, Daniela. Thank God someone responded to the vacancy. Can you imagine where you'll need to go? I can. I have the map right in front of me. The man smiled kindly. So, have you already thought everything through and made a final decision? Daniela hesitated slightly, not knowing how to express her doubts in the gentlest way. Well, she began. I would like to know more details, but overall, yes, I've thought about it, and if there are no other problems aside from the long distance, then I agree. Don't worry about that, you'll get there by helicopter. It's just about three kilometers on foot from the drop-off point to Senor Alonso's estate. Estate? Daniela was surprised. It's not just a house. Yes, it's an estate with many buildings. You will be living in the house with Senor Alonso. Besides the owner, there are two more people living on the estate, and there's a cook who also does the housekeeping. You will be the third person. I assume you have experience as a caregiver? I have a medical education, and there are a few other things in my background, but I would prefer to discuss them in person. Of course, Daniela, come to the address indicated on the business card, I'll be waiting for you. I have two free hours, so hurry up, and then we can discuss all the uncertainties and details. Ruben Crespo turned out to be a pleasant man, slightly plump with a shiny bald head. Daniela felt that he had heart problems, not that there were any external signs indicating it, but she had had that gift since childhood. She could sense what kind of illnesses a person had, and she was usually accurate in her predictions. Their conversation was meaningfully at light, as if they had known each other well even before this meeting. Daniela's criminal record didn't bother the man at all. He simply waved it off and recited a joke. There's a biathlete running penalty laps because they won't give him a rifle due to his criminal record. And with that sensitive question, the conversation immediately came to a close. The next morning, Daniela boarded the helicopter at a small airfield, personally driven there by Senor Crespo. Is the flight long? Daniela asked as a final question. About 11 hours, with three refueling stops, the lawyer replied and looked at his watch. You'll arrive at around 8 to 9 p.m. 
He closed the door of the helicopter cabin, waved goodbye, and quickly headed towards his car, apparently in a hurry. Daniela's heart started pounding fast and unnaturally loud again. She sat in the back seat wearing headphones with a microphone to always stay in communication with the pilot, but during the first half hour of the flight, he hadn't said a word. Daniela had never flown before, not even on helicopters, let alone regular passenger planes. Looking down from above at her hometown and the vast expanses that opened up beyond its borders, she marveled at their beauty and grandeur. Down there, when walking through narrow streets and hardly ever leaving buildings, everything didn't seem that big. The whole world seemed to revolve around familiar places from childhood, appearing small and cozy. But once you look at the same things from a height of at least 300 meters, the mind can no longer comprehend such scales. Even from 10 kilometers away, everything will seem less significant. However, the altitude at which the helicopter was flying reflected the true magnitude most vividly. She didn't know anything about this world. Some miserable zero point something and a few thousandths of a percent fit into her consciousness and seemed sufficient to consider herself knowledgeable about the world, but that wasn't the case. She knew nothing. Until the first refueling, the sky was clear, without any clouds, and Daniela had a chance to fully enjoy the views. While the silent pilot was busy at the airfield, she managed to have a snack and use the restroom. But after an hour of flying on the second leg of the journey, a layer of low clouds formed, and the pilot raised the helicopter to a height of one and a half thousand meters, with the clouds now below, obscuring the views. The monotonous hum of the engine made Daniela fall asleep, and she slept almost until they reached the intended village, unaware of the pilot refueling for the second time. She opened her eyes and saw vast expanses of forests below, with winding rivers and the peaks of tall mountains scattered here and there. In this gray-green sea of untouched nature, she occasionally spotted small houses of unknown villages or isolated huts, probably meant for hunters or workers. Bears, wolves, wild boars, and moose surely ruled over this area, and there were likely people with less than pure intentions coming here to scavenge. The pilot, who had remained silent the entire way, finally spoke up. We're almost there, about 15 more minutes until we arrive. How are you feeling? Good, Daniela replied into the microphone. There's fog below, fasten your seatbelt, just in case. I'm already strapped in. From a great height, the fog seemed like a light haze settling in the lowlands, but as they descended, it became denser and more extensive, completely obscuring the ground. The pilot was clearly tense. Prior to landing, it seemed that the rotor blades had cleared the mist on a small clearing, revealing a smooth surface covered in clover and grass. The landing was successful. Stretching her stiff joints, Daniela stepped out of the cabin, supported by the pilot's hand. As soon as the blade stopped spinning, the fog once again blocked visibility, making it difficult to see clearly even at a distance of 10 meters. Daniela looked at the man bewilderedly. He understood her silent question and, pointing towards the north, explained. You'll walk along this trail without turning anywhere, and about 100 meters ahead, there will be a narrow bridge. From there, there are no obstacles. The trail is clearly visible, you won't get lost. Did you see the estate from above? There were several buildings on a hill to the northwest, Daniela said. Yes, that's it. It's about three kilometers from here. There's nowhere closer to land. I know this clearing well, and the terrain becomes marshy in some places beyond it. You'll reach it before dusk. Just stay on the trail. Is that clear to you? Yes, clear, Daniela nodded. Thank you. Good luck. The pilot replied, as if he immediately forgot about her existence. Taking a few steps along the trail, Daniela looked back, the helicopter was no longer in sight. She shivered, pulled the hood of her sweatshirt over her head, and continued walking. Silence hung everywhere, not even the chirping of crickets or the buzzing of mosquitoes could be heard. The silence was so profound that it clogged her ears. To her left, through the misty haze, she could see the last crimson glimmers of the sun, which had dipped below the horizon. And there was the bridge three logs laid across a ditch filled with dark water, adorned with railings on one side for appearance's sake. 
Daniela cautiously crossed to the other side of the ditch and looked back again. She had a feeling that someone was constantly watching her, but of course, there was no one behind her. However, about 20 meters ahead, to the right of the trail, a huge black figure started to emerge. Daniela abruptly stopped and froze, listening intently the silence remained undisturbed. What if it was a bear or a moose? What should she do in such a case? Or perhaps it was that same monument to the alien? She took a few hesitant steps, trying to get a closer look at the silhouette. Her heart relaxed as she realized it was just the completely rusted body of an old van that had found its final resting place here for some reason. It appeared to have burned down. The grass, wet from the evening dew, clung to her jeans, which were soaked up to her knees. Water squelched in her sneakers, and the backpack on her back was starting to feel heavy, although Daniela had only packed the essentials for the first few days. She was told that everything she needed, including women's clothing and cosmetics, was available in the house if she happened to need them for any reason. About 40 minutes later, as darkness began to set in, the first structures of the estate appeared on the hill. Daniela breathed a sigh of relief. Now there was nothing to fear anymore. She had reached her destination. Since the entire estate was situated on the flat peak of a gentle hill, the mist couldn't reach it, making the surrounding view even more fantastical. It seemed to float in the sky, surrounded by dense clouds. In the darkening July sky, constellations of stars shimmered, growing brighter. Here, they were not hindered by city lights or advertising signs, intensifying the feeling of being detached from the earth. As Daniela looked around, she hardly breathed, struck by the enchanting atmosphere, but mixed with this enchantment was something else, reminiscent of the anticipation of an inevitable twist. After all, even in fairy tales, things never go smoothly, there is always some witch, monster, or forest spirit that compels the heroes to embark on an adventure. There was something Tim Burton's about it all. Daniela was awakened from these fantasies by an unusual sound resembling a horse's snort. She flinched, squinted her eyes, and indeed, about 30 meters ahead, next to a low building made of slightly chipped red bricks, she saw an elderly man with a sturdy build, holding the reins of a gray and large apple's horse. The man looked at Daniela intently and remained silent. The edge of an envelope, typically used for mailing letters, peeked out of the pocket of his old military-style jacket. Daniela approached him, took off her hood, and smiled. Hello, she said. I'm Daniela. I'm a little late. Where can I find the owner? The man gestured with his hands, mimicking someone cradling a swaddled baby, and nodded questioningly. For a few seconds, Daniela tried to decipher his gesture and understood it as a question about whether she was the nanny whom the owner had been eagerly anticipating. It would probably be difficult to depict a caregiver in any other way. Yes, she said, deciding that the man was mute. I'm a caregiver. Daniela tried to determine if the man could hear her and concluded that he was also deaf because he closely watched the movement of her lips. He tied the horse to the hitching post, stroked its long muzzle, and headed towards the three-story house standing at the highest point. Initially, Daniela was already heading in that direction when she heard a strange sound. Taking a few steps, the man turned around, waved his hand at Daniela to follow him, and continued walking, limping slightly on his left leg. The main door of the house was unlocked. Passing through the dark vestibule, dimly lit by only two sconces on the left wall, with a long sofa running alongside it, they climbed the narrow staircase, covered with a soft carpet, to the second floor. From there, two wings diverged in different directions, one completely dark, the other dimly lit, slightly brighter than the vestibule, with the same sconces lining the wide corridor. Windows were on the left, while small halls and room doors alternated on the right, following one after another. The man lightly tapped on one of the doors. After a few seconds, it opened, and a very thin elderly person in a wheelchair appeared at the threshold. He had almost no hair on his head, and the strands that managed to remain were so white that they seemed foreign, randomly clinging and scattered around his temples and nape. Presumably, this was Senor Alonso Valentino himself. Daniela had expected to see a completely feeble old man who couldn't get out of bed, 
but the movements of the owner were quite lively, although it was noticeable that he had to make an effort. Daniela? He asked with a slightly hoarse, yet loud voice, surveying the girl from head to toe. It seemed as if they were already well acquainted, and Daniela unexpectedly came to visit after some separation. Hello, the girl said. Are you Senor Alonso? That's me. The man deftly maneuvered his wheelchair and rolled into the corridor. Please love and favor. Well, maybe love is an exaggeration, but I've been eagerly waiting for you, Daniela. You have no idea how much. Sorry for being informed right away. I can do that. I'm just three steps away from God. Thank you, Angel. He addressed the escort who had been attentively observing their conversation. You can go. I'll show and tell her everything myself. Off you go. The mute man nodded affirmatively, turned around, and limped away, apparently on urgent business. Let's go. Valentino spoke again. I'll show you your room. And he rolled further down the corridor. And what about Angel? Daniela began her question, trying to walk alongside him. My longtime friend, Senor Alonso, interrupted her. He helps around the house, takes care of the stable and Temerario. He's been here for 20 years, deaf and mute, so try to make sure he sees your lips if you have any questions for him. I've already figured that out. And Temerario, is that the name of the horse? Yes, another old friend, 22 years old, quite old for a horse, but he holds his own in the saddle. Here we are, come in. Valentino pointed to the door, and Daniela grabbed the handle and opened the room. The light switch is to the right, the man instructed her. Daniela turned on the light. The room turned out to be small but very cozy, furnished with a wardrobe, a wide bed, a writing desk by the window that presumably faced the inner courtyard of the wing, a beautiful desk lamp with a green velvet shade, a sturdy ornate chair, a bedside table, and another door, possibly leading to the bathroom. A dark-colored carpet covered the entire floor, paintings of lakes and waterfalls adorned the walls, and there was a small bookshelf with books. On the spine of one of them, Daniela managed to read The Gold of Rebellion. How do you feel about horses? Senor Alonso asked again. Have you ever ridden? I have a great affinity for horses, Daniela replied, tearing her gaze away from examining the room. But I've never ridden one. Oh, that needs to be rectified. I'll definitely ask Angel to teach you how to ride. Timorario is a calm and docile horse, and he knows this area like the back of his hoof, better than any of the tourists around here. He knows trails that are best left untouched. Once you've mastered the basics, you should ride Timorario in your favorite places. Trust me, you'll love it. We have a special kind of nature here, and you'll understand it as soon as you're there. Daniela couldn't help but laugh at something. Okay, she said. Just don't forget about caution, Valentino added, looking into the girl's eyes attentively. The places here, although beautiful, conceal many dangers. That's why I suggested exploring them together with Timorario. If you're going alone, be sure to wear rubber boots. You can find a pair that fits you in the vestibule downstairs. Dangers? Daniela asked, seeking clarification. Yes. Haven't you gathered any information about the local area? Only briefly. I saw that it's very far from where I live, but I didn't delve deeper. That's strange, Valentino mused. Nowadays, people usually turn to the internet for any information. Keep in mind that there are no computers or mobile networks here. We receive and send correspondence the old-fashioned way in written form. In fact, Angel just took a dispatch to the village. Has the infrastructure not reached this place? The girl asked. They haven't reached here, and thank God for that. I myself am not a supporter of all these information technologies. They have changed social structures to such an extent that life has almost completely lost the drama of action. Everyone is fixated on the drama of words, communication through networks, gathering information through networks, even interest in a subject is based on comments from those who have studied it on site. This leads to a lot of falsehood, instant gratification, insincerity, and premature judgments. 
but here I am rambling like an old man. I apologize, you must be tired from the journey. There will be time to talk, including about the dangers. For now, let me briefly mention the boots. Sometimes, electrical discharges erupt from the ground, right on level ground. You could be walking along a path you've walked a hundred times before, and suddenly you're thrown off balance, as if knocked down, unable to understand where you are or even your own name for the first few minutes. Rubber protects against that. One of the reasons I spend most of my time in this wheelchair is precisely because of such a discharge that I encountered five years ago. Sometimes I can still walk, but not far and not for long. And don't think I'm always talkative and will bore you with my ramblings. Right now, I'm on painkillers, which is why my tongue is loosened. Most of the time, I suffer from pain and remain silent so as not to offend anyone unnecessarily. You have a medical background, don't you? Yes, I do. That means you can administer IVs and injections for me. Angel is quite clumsy in that regard. A doctor from the village comes a couple of times a week. He'll tell you all the details of how to properly care for me. All right, Daniela nodded. Thank you, Senor Alonso, for the work and for this cozy room. I really like it. Oh, it's thanks to you that you weren't afraid to venture into this wilderness. Not everyone would dare to do that. Well, that's it. I'm off. Rest well. Good night. What time do you usually wake up? Daniela decided to ask one last question. Valentino smirked. Well, I think I stopped sleeping altogether about four years ago, so just knock on my door any time, day or night, like that. And Senor Alonso rolled away, his gray hairs on top of his head, resembling antennas, fluttered in the breeze. Daniela closed the door, finally took off her backpack from her back, and sat on a chair, resting her elbows on her knees, still damp from the dew. Valentino's remark about painkillers unsettled her. Deep inside, a momentary doubt flared up. What if there was something wrong with those painkillers, and a person with her reputation was needed to uncover the truth? Based on her bitter experience, Daniela couldn't help but entertain such thoughts. In her situation, such thoughts were completely natural, but she didn't want to believe in them. She already liked this place, with its fog and secrets, lightly touched upon by Valentino, and her heart warmed at the thought. Moreover, the host seemed funny and kind at first glance, and it was impossible to imagine that he had only a month left to live. Daniela didn't feel the presence of death around him as she had felt with the terminally ill before. But maybe her senses were dulled due to fatigue? Eleven hours on the road, even though she managed to get some sleep, still took their toll. All right, it's time to wash up and go to sleep. The host didn't offer her any food, and she only had an energy bar and a can of cola left as provisions, but she didn't feel like eating. Daniela undressed, rinsed off in the shower behind the second door, turned off the light, and crawled under the blanket. She woke up early. Getting herself ready, she decided to take a walk around the house, but outside Valentino's door, she heard two men talking. She knocked and a second later entered, remembering that Senor Alonso had allowed her to disturb him at any time. The second man turned out to be the village doctor, who had arrived early in the morning to give his final instructions and consult with Daniela. Valentino sat in his wheelchair and was not as talkative as he had been yesterday. He constantly frowned, apparently in pain, and avoided looking at Daniela, as if afraid to meet her gaze. The doctor introduced himself as Senor Castillo. The consultation lasted about 20 minutes and covered topics such as intravenous drips, medications, injections, their frequency, and strict adherence to the instructions written on the sheet. Senor Castillo's handwriting, like that of all doctors, was illegible, but Daniela had studied to be a pharmacist, so deciphering the scribbles wasn't a big problem for her. Considering his mission accomplished, the doctor bowed and left. We have breakfast at 8 o'clock, Valentino said when they were alone in the room. But if it's more convenient for you at a different time, let Virginia know. She'll adjust the schedule. Virginia is our cook. She doesn't live in the house. She comes from the village every day except Sundays. She's a good girl and cooks deliciously. I'm on a strict diet myself, 
but Angel loves her cooking. Oh, come on. Daniela said. At 8 o'clock, then. Do you need anything right now? No, Fucundo has done all the morning procedures. He was with me since 5 a.m., so you're free until lunch. Have your breakfast and make sure to visit the stable. Get to know Temerario better. If you want, you can take your first horseback riding lesson with Angel. All right, Senor Alonso, Daniela nodded. Then we say goodbye until lunch? Yes, Valentino said, approaching the open window where swallows were fluttering about. I'll miss you, he added and turned around. His expression seemed childishly simple and naive to Daniela. She smiled and, without saying anything more, left the room. She quickly established contact with Temerario. The horse turned out to be non-stubborn and friendly. Before breakfast, Daniela managed to get in the saddle and take a few laps around the perimeter of the stable. She enjoyed this activity very much and decided that she would definitely continue to develop this new skill. Moreover, Daniela had read somewhere that horseback riding strengthens the back muscles, which she needed to finally get rid of her occasional pains. Everything here seemed familiar and close, as if she had returned home after many years. She liked the seclusion of the estate amidst the forests and swamps. She liked the sky that seemed so low and saturated with blue. She liked Valentino, whose imminent death was hard to believe, and Angel inspired trust and sympathy. Being with him, Daniela felt protected. She even forgot for half an hour about the true purpose of her stay here, and when she remembered, she became upset because she would inevitably witness death and sorrow, and then return to her old life, from which she had easily distanced herself. And what would happen to her next? Ah, if only she could stay here forever, wandering through the forests, riding on hidden paths on Temerario, drinking water from the springs, and not thinking about anything. At least, not thinking about anything sad and never recalling her past, which had never known such emotional balance as today. After the horse ride with Angel, Daniela went to have breakfast. She met Virginia, a 25-year-old girl with thick blonde braids and dreamy blue eyes. Her light green car was parked near the house, the one she used to drive to the estate. The doctor had also told Daniela that in case of an emergency, Virginia could take her to the village if it wasn't late in the evening or a Sunday. Daniela remembered her first encounter with Angel when he rode off on Temerario to the village with an envelope in his pocket. Apparently, the correspondence was so urgent that waiting until the next evening for Virginia to pick up the letter was not an option. This fact, along with Valentino's fluctuating mood and his cautionary advice for Daniela to be careful, added a certain intensity to the peaceful atmosphere, making it even more piquant and intriguing. Breakfast turned out to be truly delicious. After finishing the meal, everyone went about their own business. However, until half past 11, when Daniela had to administer a couple of injections and check Senor Alonso's condition, she didn't have any particular tasks. Following Valentino's advice, she put on rubber boots and decided to explore the estate grounds in more detail. In addition to the main house where the owner himself, Angel, and Daniela resided, there was a stable about 50 meters away, something resembling a storage building, single story with a barn lock secured by thick iron hinges. On the opposite side stood a small chapel, which Daniela hesitated to enter because she wasn't sure if it was appropriate for a girl to enter with such a deep neckline of her favorite t-shirt. A bit lower, where the flat surface gradually turned into a slope, there was a pumping station with a buzzing motor behind a closed door, and next to it stood a tall mast from which wires extended to the house and the stable. The power line came from the direction of the village, paralleled by a dirt road that descended downward and disappeared into the forest, which began right at the foot of the hill. That was the entire estate, or at least the visible part that Daniela managed to explore before lunch. Behind the house, a nearly overgrown foundation could be discerned, apparently intended for the construction of another building, but for some reason, the construction had been frozen. Further on, among the dense trees, Daniela noticed a human figure in strange gray clothing. She approached closer and realized that it was not a person, but a monument, almost her height. It piqued her curiosity, and she came up to it. The sculpture depicted a young woman holding a baby in her arms with folded wings behind her back. 
Below the sculpture, there was a neat flower bed with pansies and some other small flowers whose names Daniela didn't know. Between the flower bed and the monument, there was an inclined marble panel bearing the inscription, Ana Benitez, April 4th, 1971 to August 26th, 1999. Senor Alonso appeared to be around 60 years old, although his thinness and illness might have added a few more years to his appearance. The woman buried here couldn't be Valentino's younger sister because she had a different patronymic. Could she be his wife? Then she would have been at least 12 years younger than him. Daniela pondered whether to ask the owner about this grave, but decided that, for now, it might be better not to. It was unclear what tragedy had occurred in this estate and what kind of mark it had left on Senor Alonso's soul. During the midday procedures, the man hardly uttered a word. The pain that had started in the morning continued to torment him. He tried not to show it on his face, but he wasn't successful in concealing it. Daniela followed the instructions carefully and precisely, and she didn't bother Valentino with any questions either. The pain relievers were only supposed to be administered once in the evening, and perhaps then there would be time for conversation if the occasion arose. A whole week flew by unnoticed with such simple tasks, medical procedures, horseback riding lessons, breakfasts, lunches, dinners, evening preparations for sleep, and even occasional reading of the books on the shelf. Every other day, Angel carried Valentino outside in his arms, transferring him to a different wheelchair, and Daniela walked with them to the rugged part of the hill from where they had a view of the river and the vast field beyond it, scattered with recently mowed hay bales. They often remained silent there. Senor Alonso stared into the distance, lost in his own thoughts. Sometimes he furrowed his brow, while other times he smiled, seemingly recalling pleasant memories. They never visited the grave, and Daniela never mustered the courage to ask Senor Alonso about it. The only thing that troubled her in all of this was that Valentino was fading away before her eyes each passing day. The medications temporarily held back his decline, making it less painful, but now Daniela understood that Senor Alonso wouldn't live until mid-August. Now, as he stayed in the house, he spent more and more time in bed. He moved less gracefully in the wheelchair than he did on the first day they met, and during the past couple of days, he only went to one room at the far end of the corridor. The key to that room hung around Valentino's neck, and apparently, only he had permission to enter. Daniela didn't dare ask about the contents of that room because the sight of Senor Alonso locking it, when she accidentally caught him doing so, indicated that such a question would be entirely inappropriate. It added an air of peculiarity to the atmosphere. And in the late evening, as she gazed at the mist swirling behind the hill, Daniela imagined herself as a prisoner in Dracula's castle, except Dracula, in her case, wasn't a vampire or a monster, but rather a captive just like her, unable to find a way to break free from this sweet captivity. In the evening of Sunday, Valentino handed Daniela an envelope, she opened it, and inside were the money's payment for her first week of work, 2,100. Daniela mechanically counted them, and it suddenly made her uncomfortable. The money was significant for her, considering that she hadn't really done much work. Virginia, for example, worked much harder and brought much more benefit. Daniela felt her face flush. Valentino, attentively observing her, looked away, as if he too was unsettled by something. Thank you, Daniela quietly said. I hope I'm worth such an amount. Don't even doubt it reassured her the man, looking up again, it's always like that with money. You know, I once heard that 80% of people who make expensive purchases in stores feel ashamed about it. Why is that? Money is a subconscious thing, so to speak, you should never take it too seriously, it's always lurking in your mind anyway. Daniela inwardly agreed with Senor Alonso, wished him a good night, and went to her room. The next day, after completing all the procedures prescribed by Valentino and having breakfast, Daniela decided to ride Temerario beyond the estate for the first time. Senor Alonso had mentioned three trails that the horse knew well the River Trail, the Ravine Trail, and the Big Trail. They were named as such because Temerario understood those words. Daniela just had to whisper one of the names into his ear, and he would know where to go so she could relax in the saddle and simply admire the surroundings. 
Daniela was already quite skillful at getting into the saddle, which always brought a smile to Angel's face. He was a good mentor, even though he only communicated through gestures. River Trail, Daniela whispered, leaning over Temerario's ear. The horse flinched, twitched its ears, and slowly started moving. The main part of the path went through a wide, beaten forest road. Tall pines shimmered in the sun with copper trunks covered in moss, while spruces looked mysterious and wild, as if some secret hid within their dense branches. Somewhere in the distance, a crow cawed raucously, something crackled and rustled in the undergrowth, and a buzzard soared high in the sky, scanning for prey with its keen eyes. Everything here amazed and simultaneously frightened Daniela, but Timorario walked confidently and calmly, indicating there was no danger. Suddenly, the horse veered off the road to the right, onto a barely noticeable trail, and Daniela's heart sank. Where was he going? Why didn't he stick to the normal road? But she didn't stop Temerario. She trusted that if he was going this way, there must be a reason. In this part of the forest, the density was not as thick as it appeared from the road. Mostly pine trees grew here, which provided good visibility and allowed the sunlight to shine through. It was quiet and humid, with only the crunch of dry branches under the hooves, occasionally startling the drowsy pheasants that flew out with a whistle from the grass or low heather bushes. After about ten minutes on the forest section of the route, a rumble became audible, growing louder with each step. The forest began to thin out, and finally, they reached a path that ran along the riverbank, hence it's named the River Trail. Here, the river made bends, and the bank they were approaching had been eroded by the current, forming something like a sandy pebble beach. The view was so beautiful that it took Daniela's breath away. Temerario stopped, snorted, and nodded his head. Daniela had been warned that sometimes they needed to dismount so the horse could rest and eat. After all, he was not young, and he needed to be taken care of. Angel had taught her how to properly tie him up. Daniela dismounted, chose a spot with grass, and hung the reins on a low branch of a fir tree so that Temerario could reach the fresh grass freely. He immediately started nibbling, swatting away the persistent flies with his mane. Mosquitoes bothered Daniela as well, but she almost didn't notice the painful bites as she immersed herself in the beauty of nature. Searching with her eyes for a gentler descent, the girl wanted to get closer to the river when she suddenly saw someone emerging from the water onto the shore. He was about 20 meters away from her, and she could see him clearly. It was a young man completely naked, with a powerful torso and handsome facial features. He noticed her too but showed no signs of embarrassment. Instead, he smiled and waved in greeting. Daniela got scared no one had warned her about this. Where did this person come from? Who was he? The nearest village was not close by. Why was he here? Hastily, the girl returned to Temerario, untied the reins, and jumped back into the saddle. The horse clearly wasn't pleased with not being given a proper rest, but there was no need to force him to move forward. The young man didn't face Temerario in the slightest. Returning to the estate, Daniela headed straight to Senor Alonso to tell him about what had happened. He initially frowned, but then smiled slightly and waved his hand. That's my nephew, he said. Gabriel. You didn't tell me anything about him, Daniela replied. Well, what is there to say? He lives in the guest house, hardly ever seen around here because I didn't tell him to wander about. It's none of his business. Do you not get along with him? It's not that, really, Valentino pondered for a moment. He's an okay guy, but his head is empty. He had a thing for Virginia for a while, so much so that she asked me to shield her from his persistence. He's clueless, doesn't know any better. My late brother's son, his mother passed away long ago. Seems like an orphan, but you wouldn't think so. All jokes and no substance. Oh well, don't let it bother you. He won't harm a fly. How did you like the ride? I enjoyed it, beautiful places. Next time, go to the ravine, the loop is a bit longer, but the scenery is wilder, with hardly any beaten trails. All right, agreed Daniela. I'll go there tomorrow. The morning was cloudy but warm. 
As usual, Daniela went to Valentino first, who was somewhat excited because, as he explained, an important guest was expected for lunch. The daytime procedures had to be postponed indefinitely due to this, so Daniela had the whole day free after breakfast. She decided to take advantage of the situation and went on the second route that Senor Alonso had recommended to her yesterday. In the low gray clouds, around 11 o'clock, breaks of light began to appear, indicating that the rain Daniela had feared was likely to be canceled. The loop called the ravine ran almost entirely through the forest. There were no visible trails here at all, but Timorario walked confidently, relying on markers known only to him. Some semblance of a road began to emerge closer to the lowland, gradually transitioning into a genuine ravine, at the bottom of which a babbling brook resounded. Perhaps that's why the route was named the ravine, but as Daniela descended further, Timorario grew more alert, something clearly unsettled him. Daniela involuntarily started looking around. Could some creature be lurking behind the spruce tree? So far, she hadn't encountered any animals other than birds in these surroundings. She had asked Valentino about predators, but he looked at her with surprise and assured her that this was a special zone where large animals tended to avoid venturing. What he meant by special remained unclear to Daniela. She didn't bother to dwell on it and simply took Senor Alonso's word for it. Just 10 meters from the brook, Temerario came to a complete stop and began to back up, tossing his head from side to side. It was only then that Daniela noticed the strangeness that frightened the horse, an indistinct misty ring was approaching them, crossing the brook, resembling the smoke rings exhaled by smokers. It moved slowly, swirling slightly counterclockwise and seeming to curl inward. Daniela herself became uneasy. Timorario continued to retreat, his eyes filled with blood, his breathing rapid and heavy. The horse's behavior scared the girl as much as this foggy anomaly did. Her thoughts became momentarily jumbled in her head. At first, she wanted to dismount and somehow calm Timorario down. She took one foot out of the stirrup, but then thought it would be better to stay in the saddle and try to turn the horse around. As she attempted to place her foot back, in the stirrup, she missed and, due to inertia, leaned her entire body to the right, while Timorario came down with his body movement to the left. It became difficult to stay balanced in the saddle, Daniela was increasingly tilting to the side. She barely managed to free her other foot when Timorario reared up and, throwing off the girl, turned around and galloped away. Painfully hitting her shoulder on the ground, Daniela tumbled downhill. When she found herself in the center of the misty ring, she felt as if she had been struck by an electric shock in her head. Bright, orange sparks flashed before her eyes, and she lost consciousness. Awakening, Daniela found herself only when it was starting to get dark. She looked at her watch. The hands were motionless, frozen at half past eleven. The sky had once again become densely covered with clouds, making it impossible to determine the current time. Fog had enveloped everything around, and in the distance, an owl hooted. Daniela attempted to get up, feeling her whole body ache and her shoulder in great pain. She moved her hand, thankfully, no fractures, but a significant bruise seemed likely. Dizziness overwhelmed her as she started to survey her surroundings, trying to choose the right direction to go. Everything was completely incomprehensible. Only by the brook, it became clear that she needed to move away from it and uphill, so Daniela followed suit. The fog at the top wasn't as dense, but all the places she had traversed during the day now appeared unrecognizable in the twilight. After half an hour of walking, she could no longer be certain if she was going in the right direction. She was about to sit down under a spruce tree and rest when the smell of smoke reached her. The wind was blowing from the west, indicating that there was either a bonfire or a village in that direction, although according to logic, the nearest settlement should be quite far away. Daniela turned west. She decided that it was in that direction, although she didn't know why. After another 50 meters, a bright fire came into view. Indeed, it was a burning bonfire. Clearly, in the middle of the night in the taiga, one could encounter not only friendly tourists, but also various other people, such as fugitive prisoners, poachers, drunk gold prospectors, or loggers, that's what came to her mind. She needed to approach cautiously, observe, and try to understand who the people sitting by the fire were. 
In any case, being close to others was safer than being alone in pitch darkness. And at the estate, they should have realized she was missing if Temerario returned home without his. Rider. Perhaps Angel and Gabriel had started this bonfire while searching for her. And how was Senor Alonso doing without his procedures? Daniela slowed her pace, instinctively crouched down, trying to step as quietly as possible, and in that moment, she heard a male voice ahead, about five meters away and slightly to the right. Oh my God! exclaimed the dark figure, emerging from the spruce branches. You scared me. For a moment, I thought you were the Yeti. What? Daniela asked, nearly collapsing from fright. The man approached a little closer, hastily fastening his pants and scrutinizing the girl attentively. From what could be discerned in the darkness, he appeared to be around 35 years old. He was quite broad-shouldered, bearded, and wearing a wide-brimmed hat. The Yeti, the stranger explained, quickly regaining his composure. Yes. Have you heard of it? Are there Yetis here? Well, you see, they say they've been sighted, but personally, I haven't been fortunate enough. Don't worry, I'm not dangerous, the man smiled kindly. And forgive me for being caught in such a situation. Nature called, and who would have known that I'm not alone in the deep forest? How did you end up here? I got lost. Are you a tourist? No, I work at the estate. At Alonzo's? Yes, him. Are you familiar with him? Only by reputation. But that's about four kilometers from here, no less. How did you manage to wander so far, especially at night? It's a long story. I was riding, but the horse got scared of some kind of foggy ring, threw me off, and ran away. I lost consciousness and woke up when it was getting dark. That's how I ended up here, off the trail. I see, I see, the man grew weary. What's this foggy ring called, a S-L-Y-P-H? What? Daniela didn't understand again. It's called a S-L-Y-P-H. A moving ring of fog that suddenly overwhelms you with fear. I guess so. Is that what it's called? That's right, a S-L-Y-P-H. It's a terrifying thing. Did you end up inside the circle? I don't remember, maybe. If that's the case, it's not surprising that you lost consciousness, but it's amazing that you can still think straight. You're scaring me, Daniela said. You seem to know absolutely nothing about these parts, the man shook his head. Judging by your stories, nothing at all, the girl agreed. What's your name then? Daniela. I'm Peter, nice to meet you. Likewise. Come on. I'll take you to the campfire and introduce you to my friends. We're ufologists from the capital. We come here every year. Daniela was about to say her silly word again, but she remained silent. This time she realized who ufologists were. Around the campfire sat five people, two of whom were women. They were cooking something in a large pot, and a delicious aroma filled the air. Peter introduced the girl to his comrades and told them everything Daniela had managed to tell him. Wow, one of the men named Matteo exclaimed in surprise. This is the first time I've seen someone who got so closely acquainted with the SLYPH. And how did it feel, may I ask? Can you describe it? I doubt it, Daniela said. She really didn't remember much and it wasn't pleasant to recall. Just sparks in front of my eyes, she added. But that's probably because I hit my head. There's a stream there and small stones around it. Let me have a look. One of the women stood up and carefully examined Daniela's head. Yes, you have a scrape on your temple. It needs to be treated. It's not necessary, Daniela objected. My head doesn't hurt. I just bruised my shoulder. Objections are not accepted, the woman insisted, went into the tent, and returned with a small bag from which she took hydrogen peroxide, cotton wool, and a bandage. Skillfully treating the wound, she nodded approvingly and smiled. Now I'll be at ease. Aren't you hungry? Peter inquired. I wouldn't mind. Daniela didn't object. It smells delicious here. 
Then please, join us. Peter became enthusiastic. Maria, please get some dishes. For another hour or so, Daniela sat by the campfire in such a pleasant and caring company. Soon, another couple joined them, a husband and wife who had been setting up some equipment in the field before. Daniela learned a lot of interesting things from these people. It turned out that the area around the village was called the Western Anomalous Zone or the Western Triangle. In the past, enthusiasts of exotic theories and investigations would flock here from all corners of the country. They talked about fiery orbs, orange and white ones, about crop circles, about encounters with the Yeti and extraterrestrials, about the SLYPH and electrical discharges erupting from the ground. It seemed that everything Daniela had ever heard or read about was concentrated here. Only the chupacabra hadn't been mentioned. But now, it seemed that the streams of tourists had diminished, firstly because it had become expensive to reach this place, and secondly, the broad interest in this kind of research had declined. People now preferred to simply believe without feeling any desire to venture into the wilderness. They also told her that Valentino himself had been one of the pioneers of this zone. Together with his wife, he had founded one of the first societies that seriously engaged in researching the area. They even built a small camp, which later transformed into an estate. Then, after some tragedy about which Daniela's new friends didn't provide details, he immersed himself in business and only occasionally returned to these places, and soon his interest in the anomalies completely waned. So, that's what it means? Daniela thought. A tragedy involving his wife. It means that the hidden grave in the grove actually belongs to Valentino's spouse. Having had a hearty dinner and listening to the monotonous speeches of the men and women, Daniela felt her energy completely drain away. Her eyes grew heavy, the stories turned into continuous droning that no longer conveyed any meaning. They allocated a spot for her in a tent and offered her to sleep there until dawn. Daniela gladly agreed, and as soon as her cheek touched the blanket placed under her head, she sank into a deep sleep where the mist, Senor Alonso, Gabriel, the Yeti, and Temerario fleeing away all intertwined. At dawn, she was awakened by cheerful voices and laughter from outside. Daniela abruptly sat up, and through the small window of the tent, bright morning light streamed in. Automatically, Daniela checked her watch again. This time the hands were moving but showing obviously incorrect time. She rushed out of the tent and asked for the time. Mateo replied that it was half past four. She needed to make her way back to the estate. Daniela declined the offered breakfast, tidied herself up as best she could, thanked the company for their hospitality, and set off. They told her that the path to the estate was very close, just beyond the field. When Daniela reached the path, she immediately recognized the area. Somewhere around here was where she had landed by helicopter. She breathed a sigh of relief and quickened her pace. But when she reached the familiar little bridge, she saw a car parked on the shoulder in front of the ditch. It was right at the spot where she had first discovered the charred carcass of the van, but now it was a big black jeep brand new and gleaming in the rays of the rising sun. However, there were no people inside the car or anywhere nearby. Maybe, Daniela thought. Is this the transportation the group arrived in? But why leave it so far from the camp? She immediately forgot about the absence of the van and didn't make any assumptions about where it could have gone. Crossing the bridge, she continued about 200 meters when she noticed a person on the right side of the trail. He was lying on his back, facing the grassy field, and not moving. He wore a white shirt and black pants, cinched with a wide leather belt. It looked very abnormal. Hey? Daniela called out, still hoping that the person had simply lain down on the ground for some reason, maybe had too much to drink. Of course, there was no response, the body showed no signs of life. Daniela rushed to the man, parted the grass above his face, and only then understood everything that the person was dead. The girl ran back to the camp. It was much closer than the estate, and besides, the ufologists had phones that had excellent signal reception. No one in the estate would be able to do anything anyway. After hastily explaining the situation to her new acquaintances, Daniela managed to call the police. 
They assured her that an investigative team would arrive within an hour or two and asked her to stay in place and not hurry to the estate. It turned out that the police station already knew that she hadn't returned from the forest the previous evening and volunteers had been searching the area around the ravine since morning. So Valentino had informed everyone and Daniela decided to wait for the police. Most likely, the doctor had already arrived at the estate, so there would be someone to take care of Senor Alonso today. She had to wait until lunchtime. Around half past 12, an old pickup truck pulled up and a young man in uniform introduced himself as Valerio and the doctor, Senor Castillo, whom Daniela was already familiar with, got out. The doctor, apparently, was acting as a forensic expert. They brought a photographer from the tourist company, and his equipment was state-of-the-art. After performing all the necessary procedures, the local police officer transferred the photos to his phone, loaded the body into the car with Mikhail, and drove off, taking Senor Castillo and Daniela with him. On the way, he asked the girl the same questions as when they arrived at the scene. Daniela couldn't remember anything new and repeated everything word for word. So what is it then? She asked in turn. An accident or murder? There are no signs of violence. The doctor replied. At first glance, it appears to be a heart attack. Local officer Valerio turned around and looked grimly at the doctor. The doctor was somewhat embarrassed and added. But the final word is with the experts, Daniela. They might discover a different cause. I see. The girl said quietly and decided not to ask any more questions. The main thing is, Senor Castillo added, that you were found safe and unharmed, otherwise Senor Alonso would have been beside himself. And how is he now? Honestly, not great, but not because of you, don't worry. This incident with the man in the field has affected him in a particular way. He's withdrawn and just stares out the window. I'm sorry it turned out this way. Daniela concluded and also fell silent, staring out the window of the car, which shook on the potholes. Next to the house in the estate, Daniela met Gabriel, who was sitting on the steps of the main entrance. She immediately recognized him, even though she hadn't seen him in those clothes before. The local officer went straight into the house to talk to Valentino, and Senor Castillo headed to the stable to see Angel, exchanging curt greetings with Senor Alonso's nephew. Hello, Daniela, Gabriel said, smiling. Hello, she replied, sitting down on the step as well. She didn't want to go into the house. The morning incident had left too heavy an impression on her. My name is Gabriel, the guy introduced himself. But I assume my uncle has already told you a lot of negative things about me, so we are already acquainted indirectly. He did, but not in the way you think. Oh, really? Gabriel was slightly surprised. And what did he tell you? Well, I think he will tell you himself if he wants to. Unlikely, Gabriel disagreed. He considers me a good-for-nothing and a simpleton. By the way, besides me, as far as I know, he has no other heirs. But this incident today doesn't bode well. What do you mean? Most likely, the man you found is my uncle's lawyer. He was supposed to come to him in a few days for some urgent matter. Are you sure? Did you talk to the local officer? Of course, I did. Now I'm the prime suspect, if it turns out this isn't just an accident. And my alibi isn't great, I was searching for you with the volunteers all night. In theory, I could have accidentally run into the lawyer in the field and... Is there a motive? Gabriel sighed heavily. The lawyer didn't want to see my uncle for no reason, he said. Valentino was planning to rewrite his will. I don't know the details, of course, but I'm sure the lawyer's visit was related to that. So there's a motive if it turns out that I could be left out of the list of heirs. I think you're exaggerating, Gabriel. Are you trying to reassure me? You don't even know me, yet you're so sure of my innocence? Senor Alonso mentioned once that you couldn't even harm a fly, Daniela said, looking closely at Gabriel, who raised his eyebrows at what he heard. It doesn't sound like my uncle. He said, Although, I didn't invite myself to visit him, he invited me a month ago. 
He put me up in the guest house, but didn't explain anything clearly. I'm not opposed to it. I have fond memories of this place from my childhood. I love it here, but still, the invitation was strange. Why do you think it doesn't sound like your uncle? You've been here for about 10 days or so, right? Gabriel asked Daniela. Yes. Well, I've known him my whole life. Yes, he used to be a very kind-hearted person in his younger years when his wife was still alive, my Aunt Anna Benitez. Something happened to her? I accidentally stumbled upon a grave here, behind the house. Is that where she's buried? Something happened. Gabriel paused for a second. She died in childbirth, right here in this house, and that grave is hers, yes. Angel takes care of it. My uncle stopped going there himself when he could still move around on his own. My goodness! Daniela exclaimed. And what about the child? It's complicated with the child. What do you mean? Did the child also die? No, it's worse. Daniela looked at Gabriel questioningly. Almost a year, he continued. Valentino did his best to take care of the child, but then his nerves got the better of him. He believed that the baby was to blame for the death of his beloved wife. Moreover, he suspected that the child wasn't even his. At that time, he and his wife were heavily involved in all this paranormal stuff. They had a big and lively group. In parallel, my uncle had a small business working at a physical institute. He played a significant role in a team that was directly involved in the invention of Fionite, you know, that gemstone. Now it's used in all sorts of jewelry and indispensable thing. I'm familiar with that. Daniela nodded. But I never knew why it was called that. Yes, it's named after the abbreviation of the institute itself. It was grown exclusively for use in laser systems because it had similar necessary parameters to diamond but was much cheaper. Grown? Daniela asked for clarification. How is that done? It's quite ordinary. It's grown in laboratory conditions, just like crystals grow in nature, but the growth process is much faster. Interesting. So, they realized that this gemstone could be used in jewelry by coloring the growing crystal in any desired color, thus imitating real gemstones any gemstone. And then a real boom began, and those who realized what was happening in time made a fortune. Among the lucky ones was my uncle. That's where all these riches came from. So, I got a bit sidetracked from talking about the child. Valentino suspected that his close associate could be the child's real father. The associate, of course, denied everything and even severed ties with my uncle after such accusations, but it didn't convince my uncle. In the end, he sent his poor child to a boarding school, an expensive and reputable one, of course. He couldn't see the child anymore and couldn't forgive the fact that the child, in one way or another, became the cause of his wife's death. He sent money, of course, took care of the child from a distance, but he never left the estate himself, delegating all business matters to the manager and entrusting all legal matters to his lawyer. After this story, Daniela's heart felt heavy. It resembled her own fate, as her father had rejected her for the same reason, and she had been raised in a prestigious and expensive boarding school. But could it be? No, such coincidences don't happen in life, and her surname is Guerrero, nor Alonso, or Benitez. Was the child a boy or a girl? Daniela asked, trying to suppress the excitement in her voice. I don't know. Gabriel shrugged. And no one knows. All the people who were around my uncle at that time disappeared, like Smoke, the doctor who delivered the baby, the local police officer, and all the friends and associates in ufology. They all vanished, as if they never existed. And Valentino destroyed some documents and hid others so well that perhaps only the lawyer knew about them. Why do you ask? Apparently, the same thought crossed Gabriel's mind as Daniela's. He wasn't as foolish as Senor Alonso had portrayed him. Daniela shrugged as well. Well, she said softly. Just, she was about to mention the coincidence of the mysterious child's fate with her own, but quickly changed her mind. What? Gabriel became alert. 
Oh, nothing. There have been so many sad events since yesterday evening. I'm still trying to process it all. Daniela didn't know how to steer the conversation towards a more pleasant topic. Fortunately, the local police officer ran out of the door, interrupting their conversation. Senor Castillo. He shouted loudly towards the stable. Let's go. I've got everything here. Coming. The doctor replied and slowly made his way to the car. Valerio. Gabriel turned to the police officer. What? Valerio turned around. Did you manage to find out who this person is? Yes, it's lawyer Crespo. He was a guest at Senor Alonso S. since yesterday evening, then he planned to leave, but he never made it to his car. Gabriel turned pale, his expression became visibly distraught. It wasn't that the man turned out to be a lawyer, as he had assumed, but rather that he had managed to discuss the matter of the will with his uncle, and perhaps everything had already been rearranged. Are you going to give me a ride to the guest house? He finally asked. Let's go. Valerio agreed. Goodbye, Daniela. Gabriel stood up from the steps and extended his hand to Daniela, who shook it. Goodbye. I hope so. The young man smiled. Will we see each other again? Perhaps under more favorable circumstances. Definitely. Daniela said. I think everything will be fine. Senor Alonso asked not to disturb him until the evening. During this time, he stayed in his secret room, the key to which hung around his neck. As Daniela noticed, he looked quite unwell. He seemed to have turned completely dark, as if light no longer reflected off his body but was absorbed until the very last photon. He looked more like a shadow, even his facial features seemed to have smoothed out and lost expression. This greatly concerned Daniela, but she didn't dare to object to Valentino. Around 5 p.m., he knocked on her door himself and asked her to call Angel to take him outside for a walk the last walk, as he put it. Daniela thought that the word last was just her imagination, but it wasn't. Daniela walked with the stroller to the favorite spot where Senor Alonso enjoyed the views of the river. Today was an exceptionally sunny day, the air was warm and still, everything around buzzed and chirped, swallows flew high in the sky, and there wasn't a single cloud in sight, only Valentino's shadow disrupted this harmony of life, appearing out of place on this festive day of life. Senor Alonso himself seemed to understand this perfectly, he fidgeted and shuffled in the stroller the whole time, unable to find a comfortable position. Only after about 10 minutes, he calmed down and, without turning around, asked, So, what happened to you after all? If you're talking about yesterday, I fell off Temerario, hit my head, and lost consciousness. Did you hit yourself hard? Not really, just a scratch or two. Does it hurt? Not much. That doesn't sound like Temerario. Valentino shook his head. He's named that way for a reason. He's not afraid of people or animals. Only something anomalous can scare him. Did you encounter something unusual? The tourist said it was some kind of slip or slap. I forgot already. A misty ring on the trail. S-L-Y-P-H? Valentino turned around with concern for the first time during their conversation. Yes, exactly, S-L-Y-P-H. Are you familiar with it? Well, of course. The man almost whispered. It's some kind of curse. What do you mean? It doesn't matter. Valentino said a little louder. But who else but you can I tell about it? Daniela tensed up because there was a menacing tone in Senor Alonso's voice. My wife, Anna, may she rest in peace, also encountered that thing once. Until now, no one understands where it comes from and why it has such an impact on a person. S-L-Y-P-H, S-L-Y-P-H, everyone seems to know about it, but not everyone gets to see it even from a distance, and God forbid but my wife was lucky with everything anomalous, and those spheres seemed to stick to her, and black figures roamed the corridors of this house after her. She was special, our talisman on any of our trips. If she was with us, it meant cameras and devices had to be kept on. 
That's how it was until that fateful encounter with the SLYPH. She fell ill, didn't speak for three days, and seemed not to recognize anyone, not even me. I sent her to the city to the hospital, and it turned out she was three weeks pregnant. I managed to get her back on her feet, but she gave birth prematurely, with a disastrous outcome for her. Valentino fell silent, losing more and more of his human features. In Daniela's eyes, he seemed to be melting away. It could have been a simple play of light and shadow, or something was starting to stir in the girl's mind, but it frightened her more and more. And the child? She asked almost mechanically. The child? The child survived, it's a girl. After the last sentence, Daniela snapped back to reality, shook her head, and her heart raced. And what happened to her? Where is she now? I'm sorry, Daniela. Valentino unexpectedly said. I'm tired, I want to go back to the house. All right. The girl said and folded the stroller. Her heart kept pounding, a buzzing sound filled her ears, and her thoughts started to tangle in her head. In front of the stable, when Daniela was about to call Angel, Valentino spoke again. Wait, take this. He took a key off his neck and handed it to the girl. What's this for? I'm canceling the evening procedures for today. Please, don't bother me until tomorrow, and you'll figure out everything with the key, then you'll understand it all. Daniela remained silent, and at that moment Angel came out of the stable and approached them to take Valentino from the girl. Perplexed, she sat in front of the house for another half an hour, unwilling to go inside, and twisted the strange gift from Valentino in her hands. What could it mean? The answer was so close, but she didn't want to accept it as it was. It would be too difficult to accept. Daniela decided that she would think about everything tomorrow. Today had already brought her too many worries, and she needed to forget about everything at least for this night. And that's what she did. In the morning, everything changed dramatically. Daniela overslept, and if it weren't for the knocking on the door, she wouldn't have been able to wake up until maybe lunchtime. Angel stood outside the door, looking concerned and gesturing towards Senor Alonso's room. There was no need for explanations. Daniela understood what had happened, and that thought ran through her body like an electric shock. She hastily got dressed and ran to Valentino, who lay in his bed peaceful, pale, and even with a slight smile. He was no longer a shadow, his facial features had sharpened, and for the first time, Daniela could clearly see them and was amazed to realize that Valentino resembled her. Or rather, she resembled him, the same cheekbones, the same high forehead, and the shape of the lips. Now she had no doubts left, she was the girl whom Senor Alonso had rejected, considering her responsible for the death of his wife. Was it a coincidence that he hired her to work at this estate? Unlikely. And the unexpected amnesty could only be the result of his efforts and the efforts of the now deceased lawyer, Crespo. Angel started explaining something to Daniela with gestures. She understood that he was going to ride to the village to call the doctor to confirm the death. She nodded silently. Alone in the room, Daniela burst into tears. This was what she had feared. She knew she had to forgive her father right now, but she couldn't. Why did he invade his life in this way? Did he realize his mistake? Did he regret it? She felt sorry for this unfortunate man. She herself probably wouldn't be able to endure so much pain and regret. But she had long accepted her orphanhood and had already forgiven. At least she didn't hold any grudge against him. After all, her life had been relatively good before the colony. Why disrupt it now? However, if it weren't for her father, she didn't know how long she would have stayed behind bars and what kind of person she would have become after being released. Maybe she had made it all up in her mind. Maybe he wasn't her father after all. Why did he give her the key? She had assumed that she would find documents confirming her suspicions in the secret room. But what if it was about something else? But what? Who was she that Valentino entrusted his secret to her alone? Her thoughts became muddled once again. Daniela jumped up from her chair and rushed to that mysterious room to finally resolve all her unbearable doubts. Unlocking the door, she entered and turned on the light. 
The room turned out to be very small, with pink wallpaper and a soft white carpet, unlike any other room. Oh God, it was a children's. Yes, there was a small crib in the corner next to the heavily draped window. In the crib, there were colorful toys, a small pillow, and an embroidered blanket. And right under the window, there was a writing desk covered in papers and black and white photographs. Daniela sat down on a chair and started examining the pictures. They depicted a young Valentino handsome, fit, and always cheerful, and next to him, his wife, also beautiful, but with a hint of sadness in her smile. And here was a photo of a little girl, standing and holding onto the crib's high sides, looking surprised at the person taking the photo. Could it be her, Daniela? The other photos no longer had the child. On top of all the papers, apparently birth certificates, marriage certificates, documents related to the purchase and construction of the estate, there was an envelope. Daniela opened it and took out a sheet filled with hurried handwriting. It was a letter, and it began with an address to her. Daniela, this is my final word to you. I apologize that everything turned out this way. I understand that my guilt towards you does not deserve forgiveness, but still, I must ask for it. Getting to know you a little better, I realize that you have grown into a kind-hearted person. Perhaps your heart will still have pity on a foolish, coward old man, and it will bring you some relief as I understand the position in which I have put you. Now this is your home, and all the life that was meant to happen here can still make up for what has been lost. I see that you like it here, and maybe, subconsciously, these places seem familiar to you. Every tree here is dedicated to you, every path, every stream. They know your name because only to them could I tell the story of my life when I still had the ability to move around the area on my own. On the table, you will find all the necessary documents. From Valerio, the local officer, you will take a copy of the will that Ruben Crespo did not have time to deliver to the office. You have the right to dispose of all the property as you see fit. But remember, these places belong not only to me, but also to your mother, who would undoubtedly have loved you more than anything in the world if it weren't for what happened, which cannot be undone now. Please act wisely. However, it's not for me to teach you wisdom. Forgive me. You don't have to worry about Gabriel. He received a share of the business, and I think this arrangement will suit him. He's a good guy. Try to be friends with him. In some matters, he can help you. And I also ask you not to forget about Angel. This estate is his only home, and he won't be able to live without it. Virginia can move into the house if she wants. She has dreamed of it for a long time and asked for it, but I didn't want to overshadow her youth with my imminent demise. But now, when I'm no longer here, let this house be filled only with joy and light. I love you, my daughter, even though it may be. Hard for you to believe. That's the truth. Forgive me once again and farewell. Your father. Much has changed since the day Daniela first found herself in her father's secret room. Fortunately, it changed for the better, something that would have been hard to believe three years ago. Daniela couldn't hold on to her resentment towards her father for long. Maybe for a month or two, she walked around with a frown, convinced that she would definitely sell the estate and return to the city, to her familiar life. But the people who now surrounded her needed both the estate and a good owner. They didn't say anything to Daniela, but it hung in the air, and her heart began to ache at the thought of leaving these people behind. Moreover, a new group appeared in the estate, the same tourists who sheltered her on that fateful night when everything went wrong. Daniela discovered old project documents in the house, which envisioned the construction of three additional guest houses on the property, in addition to the one where Gabriel lived. Valentino and Anna planned to create an entire ufology camp here, complete with all the necessary infrastructure. Peter, whom Daniela met that night as the first person, upon seeing the documents, became enthusiastic about this grand idea and convinced her to seriously consider reviving this quite promising project, especially since it had once been her mother's dream. Her father, presumably, simply went along with it, gradually becoming disillusioned with all this anomaly stuff. Besides, her parents were buried here, Senor Alonso was buried next to Anna. She had to stay. 
The amount of money she received from the will, in addition to the estate itself, was more than enough for construction and a worry-free life for at least another 10 years. And Daniela made up her mind. After six months, work was in full swing, and by autumn, the entire estate had transformed to the point where it was unrecognizable. Gabriel also wished to invest in such a venture, both in solidarity with Daniela and because of the prospects that appeared on the horizon as the flow of tourists increased significantly and the village itself began to come alive little by little. New job opportunities emerged and the people seemed to be uplifted, feeling a sense of purpose. Amidst all this joyful bustle, Daniela couldn't fully rejoice in the fact that her drug case was finally resolved, as notified by Officer Valerio. Senor Montero couldn't escape this time and was sentenced. The stables were also renovated, and in addition to Timorario, there were now three more horses and one foal living there. Timorario became friends with Romance, a young mare, and he too seemed rejuvenated. Angel took care of him with even greater diligence. No one rode Timorario anymore. The faithful and dedicated horse was officially on an honorary retirement. He was allowed to freely roam his favorite trails or accompany romance when she took someone for a walk in the area. Daniela herself blossomed, thanking fate for leading her to this estate, without which she couldn't imagine her life anymore. Virginia also moved into the house. Her workload became overwhelming, and she even needed two assistants. After all, Daniela recently married Peter and was pregnant with twins. In general, an atmosphere of love, creativity, and hope for the best prevailed. It seemed that this happiness would never end. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.